about what sorts of environments one might characterize as habitable. In specific, with respect to experiments that we could do on Mars Science Laboratory, we do have payload investigations that can measure the chemical elements. We do have a payload investigation that I'm associated with that can actually measure organic molecules. So one way that you can tell what you have is by putting together a number of investigations. And like all science, independent lines of corroboration help you paint a bigger picture. So for example, on Mars Science Laboratory, if you had an environment that appeared to be rich in arsenic or some unanticipated metal, and you also had a finding of organic molecules, you could begin to put a picture together about what the environmental chemistry might portend. At that. Um, I, I think this finding points to a challenge that we've known we've had for a while. Clearly, if we went to another planet or another body in, in, in the universe and we saw a human, we would recognize it as life. Uh, and there are many other forms we could probably recognize. The challenge of finding something that is significantly different than terrestrial life and life as we know it is really what um, plagues us when we think about spending the money that we do developing the instruments that we do and sending them off on a mission. And so I think it's been our strategy with the support of the scientific community to think as broadly as possible, to put measurements that we may deem reasonable in a context, so make uh, a context of the environment to explore possibilities that are not so focused on a specific molecule. For example, we would not want to at this point necessarily go to look for specifically DNA that had arsenic in its backbone. We want to keep them very broad and keep our strategy in seeking signs of life um, open to the possibility of things. We would hate to go somewhere and not see it. Yes, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Luis Fernando Silva Pinto from TV Globo in Brazil. Uh, my curiosity is whether the door that you, that you say has been opened uh, will take scientists more in the direction of looking for different environments for life here on earth or outside and if you had to pick another element another medium other than arsenic which one would you explore first so i'll answer the back end of your question first and i'll tell you i have a lot of ideas and we all knew how ideas uh, let's say propagated through the nets and so um, I'd love to talk to you offline about that. But there's a lot, you know, I have a, a long career ahead, and I have a lot of ideas I'd like to test. So I think we have lots of questions in terms of other elemental substitutions, other types of metabolism, you know, not just the way you make a cell, but also the way the cells can, can do their business. So uh, I, I, won't, I won't really uh, talk any more about that right now, but I'd say stay tuned for the next uh, 15 to 30 years. Let's say that. That said, the front of your questions in terms of looking here on Earth or elsewhere, I think yes and yes. I think that we can learn a lot here, um, not, not just the, my work, but many of the folks, the other scientists supported in the astrobiology program. And again, astrobiology, the study of life in a planetary context, we don't want to be Terran-centric, Earth-centric, life in any planetary context or asteroid context or moon context. I think that, I think it's, it's all very important. And so, uh, I guess what I'd say is I'd be, I'm happy to be involved in, in both of those. And I, I may, perhaps, uh, Mary, you want to uh, address that? So, that answers your question. Um, right here. Give your name and affiliation, please. Sure. Eloisa Villela from TV Record in Brazil. Um, I was wondering, um, from what I understood, you, you, you now open two different doors uh, here, or many more. but. One is exploration life as we knew, so expanding the idea of what life is and where it can be sustained. And the other that I was wondering if you could comment a little more is possible um, practical applications here. Um, like the professor mentioned, the um, water, uh, water waste treatments or recovery of phosphorus or what kind of other possible applications you see. I think we're gonna direct that to Jim since he introduced that and is our phosphorus expert. Um, Jim, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm still here. So yeah, the, I, this is uh, all new and spinning out, so a lot of the things just come into your head uh, instantaneously. So for example, tying together the 
bioenergy and the phosphorus uh, uh, sustainability issues. So we know we have to begin to develop uh, uh, alternative bioenergy uh, sources for uh, fossil fuels. And so people are growing a lot of plants and trying to figure out a way to grow algae uh, to make bioenergy, but all of the existing plants and, uh, and algae that we know of need fertilizer themselves. They need phosphorus themselves. So what if someone was clever enough to be able to develop a bioenergy creature a uh, microorganism based on this uh, metabolism, if it holds up, that doesn't need phosphorus. So you don't need to drain the fertilizer supply in order to solve the bioenergy problem. So we're a long way off, but I mean, I would think that this, uh, if this holds up and if we can figure out a way to do it, right, then you can have a whole bioenergy technology that's based on an arsenate uh, type organism. That's kind of science fiction. <laughs> Probably more realistic are things like uh, uh, treating uh, arsenate waste uh, uh, dumps and this sort of thing to find organisms that are capable of tolerating that or in fact thriving on that as this one does. Um, so there seem to be applications for for toxic waste treatment uh, where arsenate is often a, uh, often an issue. So I think that's another practical aspect that people will start to work on once uh, we we start to learn more about the situation. So yeah, it's pretty exciting to uh, think about the possibility of organisms and living things that might be able to live without phosphorus. And uh, for example, just going back to the bioenergy situation, one of the big problems that bioenergy schemes have is that if you make an algae or a cyanobacteria-based bioenergy system with the regular organisms, pretty soon it's going to get infected with other organisms, like it's going to be invaded by things you don't want. Well, uh, one way you could avoid that is that all those other invaders are probably going to need phosphorus. And so if you had a phosphorus-free environment with a bioenergy organism based on arsenate instead, that's going to be pretty resistant to being contaminated by uh, invaders that you don't want. So I think, you know, there's pretty exciting stuff here if this, uh, if this holds up. I, I could also comment, I think, on the, on the end of that, Jim, and that so if, if this microbe has been something we knew, so when I said it looked ordinary, also what it does is very ordinary. So you and I breathe oxygen and we burn sugar. Same thing this microbe does. So metabolically, scientifically we'd say metabolically, it's not very interesting. It's, it's something very normal in terms of its metabolism. And the way it looks, again, we would look in the environment. We may, may not know that one thing, and it wiggles, it moves really fast. They swim quite, quite rapidly. We may not notice that, oh, that microbe is making its biomolecules out of some other element. So if, if for every one of your cells in your body right now, there are 10 microbial cells, so you are mostly microbe, what might we not understand about those microbes? So that's in you. Now let's go global. So on planet Earth, we know that it's very well supported now that microbes are some of the major drivers of the biogeochemical cycles on Earth, like carbon cycle. So if, if microbes are doing they're these major players in our own bodies and in the, in the Earth, so on our planet, if we're missing a population maybe based on arsenic, but maybe these other possibilities that we don't even know yet. I, I think it has vast implications in, in understanding the way our own bodies might work and, and help inform us about that, but also in the way our planet works. So that I think it's, I think Jim suggested in practical applications that it's absolutely, um, but some of the practical applications will develop over time to understand, well, here's the fundamental discovery and you know, it, it's gonna take an army of scientists, not, clearly not just myself and my team, but other, other people to bear on this problem with their tools and their ideas. I think it's clear from both of their answers that there's, we're opening up all sorts of new areas of research. Jim, you're practically breathless with your ideas. <laughs> well, I'm sure you'll be looking for money soon. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, you know, this, 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 uh, the ramifications of this finding are pretty significant. Before we go to the West Coast, we uh, have some time for uh, the gentleman here. If you can give your name and affiliation, sir. Sure, it's Ivan Semenik with Nature. I just have two very short technical questions. Not technical questions, but just detailed questions. Um, I'm wondering about the fraction uh, of the, the swap out. Uh, it, the, the video kind of implied all the phosphorus molecules disappearing, or atoms disappearing, being replaced with arsenic. Do you have a sense of whether it's that complete or whether it's some fraction, uh, and, and if there's some level, some threshold there? And, and for Steve Benner, if you could just clarify what it is about arsenate, arsenate that makes it a weaker link, uh, specifically. Go ahead, and. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 
I'm just trying to understand what the level of explanation should be, how the explanation should be crafted to meet the, the level at which you're interested in an answer. Arsenic has, of course, a position below phosphorus on the periodic table that has been mentioned. Because of that, it has orbitals, which we chemists like to talk about, d orbitals, f orbitals that are lower in energy. And that permits arsenate to fall apart as a, by what is called in the business an associative mechanism. That is, a, the attacking water doesn't have to wait until something leaves in order to attack. It attacks without waiting for something to leave. And that's quite different than what molecules farther up in the periodic table do. And so this is why, again, my curmudgeon wet blanket rolls. I sit here and say, I, it's wonderful to say that we're going to go to other planets and get a phosphorus-free energy, right? What we believe, based on prior experience, is that what will certainly survive from Felice's work is the microbe. And that microbe, if it grows in low phosphorus environments, that's wonderful. I mean, that can be used practically. But we don't uh, believe right now that the body of evidence saying that that molecule can't exist at the present time overwhelms the body of evidence that says that molecule does exist. And that's not a theoretical argument. That's an argument based on empirical evidence. I'm sorry, yes. Let me come in the back end of that, and maybe I should have answered first. And it's true what Steve's saying. I'd like to let him. No, get the wet blanket yeah. off. <laughs> so, disposing with the wet blanket, what I will say is, um, what we presented, so that was an artist's rendition, absolutely, to illustrate the point. If you're not so familiar with seeing those molecular structures, I think what we presented, the parsimonious way to interpret this, arsenic was absolutely associated with DNA fraction, purified on a gel. To address what Steve's saying, how it survived all the manipulation, if you're aware of how we do DNA extraction, unknown. It migrates at a different level. I'll be a bit technical for a second. Migrates at a different rate. I think it's supercoiled. I've done things like cesium chloride gradients, again, a little bit technical. It's weird. And I'll be honest, that I've been asked a question like, well, what did you think? Were you Eureka? No, I'm a biochemist. I said, this isn't right. Something's wrong. I must have made a mistake. And you'll see there's a laundry list of fantastic co-authors. And I got a reputation at, at meetings. Somebody would give a talk, whoa, I think that's a type of mass spectrometry. You could do this. And so they see me coming. They wouldn't know who I was, but they knew that I was going to ask them to measure something for me. And often I asked them to do it blindly. And they often said, and if I were there, we would stare at the data and they would sit back, very experienced scientists. Well, what am I looking at? No, 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 what, what do you think it looks like? No, no, Felisa, what's in the sample? No, 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 what do you think it looks like? It's often 2 a.m., you know. So, so the answer, is, uh, from my viewpoint, in how much arsenic is substituting. I, I think right now we don't know. If you look at the data that we're presenting in the paper, it varies. And again, to be technical for one moment, we've measured these cells in stationary, so it's old age for the cell. So they've, they've reached a point, you grow, 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 stop. And, and so the idea there is there, uh, normally we run experiments a little differently. So if you look on our supplementary evidence, we, we've showed all, we're very transparent. There is absolutely some phosphorus left in these cells. But what's unambiguous about those numbers is it is not enough to support the growth that we observe. 